Okay, so if you could um, just bring your attention right to something which perhaps we often don't do unless we're already uh, somehow familiar or trained in it, and that is to bring your attention right back inside in into your body. Uh, <clears throat> and bring your attention to the actual sensation of the contact of your body with the chair or cushion or sofa, floor, wherever you are sitting. Just bring yourself back right to that kind of um, nitty gritty, earthy reality of being present, embodied in this particular kind of body for now. The sensation of that. There may be many sensations, which we have, of course, an image about. We have an image, don't we, of this body. Although if we were, say, uh, put under sedation and suddenly woken up then in a totally dark place without any sounds or any other kind of stimulation whatsoever, it would take some time, wouldn't it, to figure out there is this thing that we call a body. There would be all these kind of sensations, uh, almost as it were floating around in space, you know, spaciousness. But of course, we would quickly re-embody ourselves, if you like, and conceive of ourselves as a particular body and a particular person, right, with a past, and uh, memories and probably even future expectations would come flooding in quite quickly, even in that very dark uh, space without any uh, sensorial <clears throat> stimulus. Anyway, my point is just come back to the raw sensations that may be occurring, however subtle, in your body right now. Uh, maybe you can bring, could you help this gentleman with a cushion um, directly? Uh, the, on the blue one. Oh, actually there are some here. Yeah. <laughs> so bring yourself to the um, actual sensation of the body. And that, may, that might even take more than a split second because we're used to at least I'm used to, and I think many people are used to, being in the head in the sense of in the thoughts and in the images in somehow that our awareness conjures up. So actually feel the sensation of where your foot is touching something, the floor, cushion, or if you're in a happen to be in a full lotus posture, then your feet would be touching thighs. How do the hands feel? The arms. Are you upright? Are you sitting upright or are you slouched? Are you, is your body straight or crooked? Can we notice these things now? Let the head be tilted slightly downwards, forwards. That takes pressure off the neck. Can you feel pressure in the neck? And how do your soul, how do your shoulders feel? Does the chest feel a little tight? Perhaps we could take a few deep breaths and let there be a sense of expelling stale air as we breathe out. Really letting go with the out breath.
or does it feel to breathe deeply? There may be flickerings of thoughts. We can notice that, but not get caught up in that associative thinking process. If the thoughts are leading us elsewhere, just gently let go, come back to the bodily sensation. And treat this as a kind of, yeah, exploration, if you like. As though we were not, well, it's difficult, but as though we were not conditioned by all these years of thinking that we know what we are or who we are or at least having some limited conditioned idea of what I am, who I am. Because from a Buddhist perspective, not only do we get into hmm, a tangle when we try and understand what the I is, let alone that, we're not even aware properly of our sensation, feelings, and other perceptions. They quickly pass by, or certain ones we grasp onto and exaggerate, certain ones we neglect, some we want to have more of, some we push away. And we're referring here to experiences connected with the eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, the touch, and the mental consciousness. All of that data, incredible amount of information coming in all the time. Most of which, of course, we don't process. It would be too much. Anyhow, we can all agree that as we sit, there is a human being, what we call a human being sitting here, approximating some kind of mindful attention towards sensation in this process in this matrix that we call a body. Kind of belonging to a person whom we call whatever, so-and-so, with a name. Let there be a sense of, um, hmm, I was going to say freedom, spaciousness at least, a sense that we don't have to do or get hold of anything. We don't have to, right now, we're not defending an opinion intellectually. We're not trying to prove that we are this or that or, or anything. And if we're a little bit bemused or confused about what has been said so far, that's okay too. Let there just be that sense of bemusement without it being a problem. It's just another event in the space of our mind, the space of consciousness, which is vast like the sky and 
can accommodate anything, everything. It's no problem. No lack of space. We might say that we suffer when we contract that space and we zoom in on something and fixate on it and feel that, yes, this I want this, or I don't want this, I don't like this. And then we create pleasant, unpleasant, or we become a little bit dull if something feels neutral. Then we don't pay it sufficient attention at all. Whereas with some things, we exaggerate what appears to be very pleasant and attractive and good, good for me. And other things we push away as unpleasant, kind of, yeah, unpleasant, ugly, not wanted, a threat, whatever. But you see, in, in either case, we are squeezing and contracting awareness so that the spaciousness is lost. We're actually creating a problem where there doesn't need to be a problem at all. We could just relate with whatever's arising in a very calm, clear, spacious way. even in a kind way, not taking anything too seriously. So let yourself relax and be at ease, upright, still, attentive. And you may find it very useful to maintain most of your attention on the breath, since it's rhythmic, it's there all the time. We can be aware of it entering and leaving the body through the nostrils. A sense of letting go with the out breath, letting go with the out breath. like a sigh of relief. Kind of relief that you feel when you don't perceive any threat, when everything somehow feels spacious, friendly, Nothing to knock up against, nothing to be conflicted with. Thoughts will come, no problem. Just recognize, see them as like bubbles or little clouds in the sky. Nothing to worry about, nothing to cling or fixate on, just let them go. Back to the awareness of breath 
uh, spaciousness around the breath. So as part of our meditation today, before we get into the main body of the session, let us examine in a reflective way, as we're still in kind of um, meditative space, how it is that we actually create a tremendous amount of damage to ourselves. So I'm going to read something. It's part of a conversation that took place between a Tibetan teacher who went to the West um, early on, even before Trungpa Rinpoche. And it brings out some of the factors that we need to be looking at in our own experience, our own life. This is not theoretical, what is being, what is going to be said now, read now is not, uh, it's not theory, really. It's to be digested, understood, and practiced. Hmm. It goes, well, there, there may be a couple of quotations, different ones. Not quotations, uh, <clears throat> readings. So please listen attentively, spaciously, but attentively. By spaciously, I mean not with any kind of expectation or uptightness, uh, without any, if possible, preformed judgments in your mind about what you might or might not hear. An open-mindedness as much as possible. So somebody asks the <clears throat> Teacher, what advice would you give to someone who came to you saying, I'm very depressed. Life has no meaning for me. I'm thinking of killing myself. Why should I live? Why should I go on? And the teacher answers, well, I can teach you not to think like that. I can teach you that tomorrow 
is different than today, and that in the past you have constantly also gone up and down. Therefore, you shouldn't be discouraged with your life. If you are depressed now, you can be learning something about yourself. You could, you can increase your self-knowledge. And I might also give you some advice about self-observation and perhaps try to find out exactly who you really are. Maybe I would ask the question, what is the problem really? Is it really very serious? If so, perhaps we could talk more, but usually the problems are really not that serious. Most of us just think we have a problem. Or you might say, and I'm adding this, you, we kind of think ourselves into a problem. I'm sure you all have had this experience where thoughts escalate, you know, like conflict between people and countries. There's escalation. Thoughts escalate, and before we know it, we've tied ourselves up and we've convinced ourselves there's a problem. Whereas if we had trained ourselves to be calm and clear and think logically and intuitively too, then we would see that really isn't that much of a problem. It's mind created. There are many expressions, don't we, in our colloquial language about this, you know, making a mountain out of a molehill. That happens. We escalate because our minds are lazy and untrained. And so we create all kinds of mischief for ourselves. Then the student asks, well, how did we tie ourselves up? How did we tie ourselves up? And this is an amazing answer in the sense that it goes very deep to the heart of practice <clears throat> by not being aware. Yeah, we tied ourselves up by not being aware. And it's possible we really love our frustration. We don't want to give it up. You know, it's what we're used to. That's our self-identity. Once you're stuck in a groove, isn't it? This is me talking now. Once you're stuck in a groove, one just goes round and round, like the old records where there was a problem with the record. It just goes on and on in the same groove. Keep on hearing the same musical notes again and again and again. Maybe it's all we know. Human beings are very contradictory. We don't like to have suffering or pain, but on the other hand, we also don't want to give it up. It's who we think we are. How can you give up what we've convinced ourselves we think we are? You know, it's not easy. It's just like those stories of humans brought up with animals or, you know, the stories you have of a, a, an eagle being brought up by chickens, you know, and the eagle thinks it's a chicken. Well, that's pretty bad news, you know, until an eagle comes around and says, hey, you know, what the hell are you doing with those chickens? Come up and I'll show you the heights and how to kill these chickens if necessary dive down on them so you know <clears throat> we're very much caught up with who we think we are once you give up suffering you can listen to your own awareness this will guide you and tell you how to continue very practical advice now from this teacher it was just amazing it's very clear and simple and deep at the same time he says, if you try to relax for a short time every day, then a sort of sensation or feeling will begin to arise, which gradually turns into something very wonderful, like a healer. 
In this way, you can heal any negativity or any kind of daily problem or conflicting temperament. When thoughts of resentment or discomfort arise, you yourself can heal them. More and more, you can eliminate your internal enemies. For example, we call anger or frustration an enemy, but all of our negativities can become part of the relaxation. In other words, genuine relaxation releases energy, which can be used to heal ourselves. He's putting something very deep, I think, very wonderfully, very simply. In other words, genuine relaxation releases energy, which can be used to heal ourselves. You see, usually our energy, when we don't realize it, of course, is used up in internal civil war, internal conflict, at a subtle or gross level, manifesting in our sense of uh, confusion, uh, indecisiveness, should I do this, should I do that, can I do, trust this, can I trust that? Basically from what we were speaking about the last few days, is lack of trust in oneself and in one's goodness. And of course, how can we trust ourselves when we're uptight and overthinking all the time? It's not possible. There's no space, there's no energy in the mind for that kind of uh, intelligence. It's too much, as we would say in India, tamasha, too much high high going on. Our minds become like a satanic circus without jokers, you know. Or you could say very strange jokers who keep on tricking us. Hmm. So that's one way to look at how we might, how we tie ourselves up and how we might be free of that very basic process. Another way of looking at this, and this is quotation from Alan Wallace, a very, I think very good modern Western scholar and meditator. He's talking about the body-mind complex, which is what we are. We're a combination of body and mind. Form of the body, feelings, perceptions, sensations, all kinds of mental factors, uh, Consciousnesses, eye, ear, nose, tongue, touch, mental consciousnesses of various degrees. Um, <clears throat> he's talking about that. That is referred to in Buddhist jargon as the aggregates, aggregates. So it refers to body mind. So he says, our closely held identification with the aggregates is the result of the mind's tentacles grasping. I, me, mine, and latching on to that. I'm okay. I'm here and not over there. This tight hold on the aggregates, grasping on to my body, my feelings, and my mind, is the root of our deeply ingrained vulnerability to suffering on all its levels. The aggregates themselves, much love body mind themselves, are not the problem. They are just the body and mind. But holding them closely, identifying with them, clinging to them, thereby isolating ourselves, creates a tear in the very fabric of our existence. And that's what creates our suffering. From the whole matrix, from the whole, you could say, amazing and complicated matrix of dependently related events, 
or you could say interdependent, intertwined events, appearances which are arising in mutual interdependence throughout the universe, I rip out one part and cling to it, declaring, here I am with my thoughts, feelings, perceptions, body and mind. My territory is separate from everyone and everything else. My body, sensations, mind, memories, and fantasies are all mine. That's our delusion. And the Buddha said that as long as we hold on to this hallucination, we hold on to these aggregates closely in that way, we will suffer. It's only a matter of time. You might go into samadhi for a thousand years, but it'll come to an end. Samadhi is like inflating a balloon. No matter how good the rubber, it will deflate. You can pump it up again, but eventually you'll be back where you started. So the Buddha's brilliance was to recognize samadhi as being a necessary step on the path to enlightenment, but insufficient by itself. Once you develop an extraordinary balance of mind and focus of attention with increasing finesse, but without mistaking that as the goal. Use this instrument of samadhi to explore the nature of reality. So that's the other thing. You know, Buddhism speaks of six realms, humans, animals, and so forth. One of the realms is the God realm. And some of these gods have lives for thousands and thousands of years and they're in a kind of samadhi but they're not enlightened why because they haven't explored the nature of reality they got hooked on the pleasure the bliss of samadhi which of course if it's lasting for thousands of years you feel yeah that's it you know um don't need to do anything else but it comes to an end because it is still a subtle delusion though and it's still has not got rid of the uh, identification with the I, the me, the mind. Even though it is not manifest while they're ex experiencing the bliss of the samadhi, but once the karmic power of that comes to an end, it will end. And Buddhism has very, very painful things to say about the end of these gods experience of that life of samadhi because they have all sorts of clairvoyant powers they can see their death coming <clears throat> and it's incredibly incredibly painful for them mentally because they thought you know they thought they thought they had reached the pinnacle of existence uh, they thought they were liberated but they weren't they were just experiencing samadhi a very wonderful samadhi peaceful pleasurable <clears throat> pleasure doesn't even touch what the bliss they would have been experiencing but it's not enlightenment it comes back to suffering hmm. anyway <clears throat> that was an aside but it's important because many people approach spirituality out of frustration and anger and pain and when we might begin to experience happiness and bliss in meditation we want that to continue and we feel that's it i don't need any more now i'm very blissful you one may have periods of non-conceptuality great clarity bliss and think well that's it wonderful but it's not it's not the end by any means it's hardly the beginning in a way you can get stuck there Far better to be suffering quite a bit and analyzing and you know dredging one's subconscious analytically rather than mistakenly feel that we're enlightened by going into bliss. Remember the story yesterday, the person who experienced so much bliss in India with his gurus. Then he had to go back home, look after his parents. Then it wasn't so blissful. He came out of the bliss. The bliss didn't help him with his parents, with day-to-day -day reality. Hmm. So we need to understand who we are, what we are, and that right now we're deluded 
into believing there is some kind of real person who needs to be protected and saved, a real me, a real I, an exaggerated I. <clears throat> That's our main problem. So we might say that to really be kind and compassionate to myself, I need to understand who I am, reality. It's not enough just to feel, oh, I have to be kind to myself. I have to take walks in nature. I have to, you know, take care of my body and so forth. Of course, of course we do. But that's not the main way to be kind to ourselves. The main way is to cut the root of ignorance, which according to Buddha is fixation on I, me, mine. That's the basic cause of our suffering. We're not being very kind to ourselves if we don't address that. Everything else is temporary band-aid. Of course, we have to be gentle, kind with ourselves and so forth, but a fundamental kindness is to, you know, if, if you are tied up with rope, like in the movies, yeah, you're tied up. You're the hero and you're tied up. And you know, and and you know that uh, if you were to, in your ordinary life, have a nice meal of your favorite food at your favorite restaurant or made by your favorite person, that would be so pleasurable. That would be so nice. That would be an act of kindness to oneself. Yeah, sure. But right now you're tied up. You can't experience that. Or even even if somebody fed you that meal while you were tied up, what would be your experience? How would you feel about it? So the point is, we have to get rid of these ropes. We have to untie ourselves to getting rid of the cause, the basic cause of our suffering, which is not lack of good food. It's lack of understanding of who we are. Yeah, this is just common sense. And plenty of people who have all the best food, the best chefs, the best cars, toilets that you feel you could live in they're so clean but these people aren't happy so why is that fixation to self that's why i me mine no space no space in the mind hardly any the only space they have is when they're in deep sleep without dreams but then they're not aware of that most people So anyway, uh, that's the ultimate kindness. Everything else is um, accessories, um, add-ons, add-ons. Basic pizza experience is missing. Yeah. Add-ons aren't enough. Hmm. So, course, I've already said enough for there to be a conversation. Um, just mention one thing again, which some people found useful earlier, and which formed the basis of some of our meditations in the past, where we were looking at um, this alternative or not totally traditional way of looking at um, loving kindness, where we explored it, or Alan Wallace, I'm basing it on Alan Wallace, how he explored it in terms of um, you know, how would we like to flourish in our life? And I'll read that section from his wonderful book called The Four Immeasurables. Um, because there's this phrase, you see, which is used in the very basic Buddhist teachings. When we look at these four immeasurables, which is our overall topic we've been looking at, uh, of loving kindness, compassion, equanimity, uh, sympathetic joy. So yeah, we're looking at loving kindness, yeah? And starting with ourselves. There's this phrase which says, may I be well and happy. Okay, very simple phrase. But, you know, one, there's a whole commentary behind that. Okay, so I'm going to read what Alan Wallace says. And please reflect and meditate while I'm reading. Well, you know, just listen very carefully. And then we'll stop. I'll stop talking and we can reflect on it for five or six minutes, okay? And after that, we can have some... Uh, discussion and maybe yeah we'll see how that goes <clears throat> so uh please be comfortable take a few deep breaths um, adjust the posture if you haven't already 
be relaxed, upright. Remind yourself you're not here to create more tension and self-torture, but actually to create the causes for happiness. That is what loving kindness is, creating causes for happiness for yourself and others. Okay. So, may I be well and happy. Play with your imagination, with your ingenuity, your sense of vision. May I be well and happy. What does that entail? It's a phrase. We're not praying that a phrase becomes true. We're directing the mind. We're directing our desire. May this become true. May it be so. What is your own sense of your own flourishing? What is your sense of your own flourishing? You know, when you neglect your plants and they start drooping and they look half dead, that's not flourishing, right? Then you give them water, you maybe whatever, talk to them, play music to them, or whatever you do. Then they start to flourish, right? Your plants flourish. So in our life, in your life, what is your sense of your own flourishing? It's individual. It's not some formula. We're not looking for a formula here. This is not an airport bookshop with three, four steps to this, that, and the other. It's in your embodied life, your life, within the context of your family, friends, colleagues, work, environment. <clears throat> Given the possibility of change, in any or all of these, what is your vision of your own flourishing? Bring that to mind. What type of person would I be to flourish as I wish? What type of person would I be to flourish as I wish? Bring, <clears throat> what type of person would I like to be? The emphasis here, of course, is subjective. Conceivably, I could be happy whether I'm living in the rubble of South Central Los Angeles or in some magnificent place in the wilderness. The primary question is, what would I bring to the situation? What quality of awareness and behavior would I have if I were to flourish? Or well, you might say, what quality of behavior and awareness would I need to have if I were to flourish? You know, we know what our plant needs to flourish, right? If we have any experience of 
taking care of plants. We know what a plant needs to flourish. But what do I need to flourish? What quality of awareness do I need to flourish? How might I, in other words, how might I be well and happy? And we're reflecting in a non-judgmental space, you could say. We're not trying to tear ourselves apart by saying, I'm not flourishing because of blah, 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 and nah, this mistake, that mistake. It, it's, we're just trying to look with great kindness at what, at these questions that we've raised. Not, there's not a court of judgment. Otherwise we start putting ourselves down. We already do that enough. It's a challenge, yeah. We may become discouraged, as we might well be if we come home to find our plants are all already half dead. You know, we might say, oh no. But the point is, <clears throat> we're trying to look at this with our open, wholesome, positive, spacious state of mind, not a clingy, anxious, grasping state of mind. Just looking, exploring with an open mind. If there's fear, a sense of fear, okay. Allow it to dissolve with your out breath. And don't start constellating thoughts around that fear. Just let it go. Let it go with the out breath.
So take a take a few minutes break. If you need to stand up, <clears throat> splash your face, drink something, take a little break. <clears throat> then we'll open it up to uh, feedback discussion. First time here. Welcome. How did you find out about us? Internet. 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 <laughs> are you a Delhi wala? Where, where are you from? From Mexico. From Mexico. Mexico. Wow. I'm just here for business. Hmm? I'm here from India for business. I'm in India for business. Business, okay. Three times here, so I can. Okay. Not the arms business. <laughs> what the drugs? <laughs> we welcome everyone. I was just wondering. And I guess will. Mexico doesn't produce for any more. Anyway, welcome. Have you been to India before? Yes, it's my fourth time. Fourth time. Does it get worse or better? I think it's good. <laughs> Business gets better. Yeah. Okay, so that's enough of a break. Um, any feedback is welcome, or none is also welcome. Psychotherapists give you one hour max. You've had an hour. Anything else is bonus. Yeah, speak up, please. I have some feedback. Yeah. Uh, it's more of an open question. Good. When you said, uh, you know, the problem is. Could you speak up, please? The problem is that Good. we relate to ourselves as. The I. Yes. And but but then what would the counterfactual be? How do you relate to yourself if you take your personal experience out of that equation? We're not saying take your personal experience out of the equation. We're saying taking some kind of fictional I, which we're holding on to, out of the equation. You can't take your experience out of the equation. But to some degree, wouldn't that still be my experience of yeah. this beautiful whatever? It's my experience because that's our habit. It's like wearing dark glasses and not knowing you're wearing dark glasses. You've been born with them and we have been wearing them. And then someone says, well, that's not the only way to look at the world. Actually, that's not the way the world is. Take your glasses off. And we're very attached to our glasses, so we can't take them off. 
it's not easy to take the glasses off. <clears throat> What do you see if you do take the glasses off? What do you see? If you do take the glasses off, what do you see? You see things clearly without exaggeration, without uh, it being deficient or exaggerated. And there's no clinging to what we see. As the Buddha said, um, and this is something which I meant to, well, since you brought it up, uh, <clears throat> I probably won't be able to find it. But what he said, to, um, ah, yes, very what he said to somebody called Bahia, and there's a whole sutra on this, and it's very famous as part of the basic teachings. What he said is this, let me read it. <clears throat> very important, very important. This is um, Bahia, okay? He was a man who the Buddha recognized as somebody who didn't have a lot of ignorance because the Buddha, uh, remember, originally Buddha thought he would not teach because he felt people just weren't wise enough to understand, especially the deeper teachings. Yeah, And he said, it would be irksome for me, it would be tiresome for me that people are not understanding what I'm teaching. It's like if you have nectar, some nectar or something wonderful and people can't appreciate it, then you don't really want to share it. It's just a waste. But, um, of course, then he was persuaded to teach. Anyway, this guy, Bahia, um, the Buddha recognized as someone who had enough wisdom to understand what he wanted to say. And he said this, he, he taught in this way to Bahia. He offered um, extremely brief, quintessential instructions, kind of Dharma revelation that might possibly have been shared in a few minutes. So here's the essence of what the Buddha told Bahia, an accomplished contemplative who was already ripe for awakening. Okay, that may not be us, but we can still benefit from these words. Yeah. This is what Buddha said to him, basically. In the scene, in what is seen, there is only the scene. In the herd, there is only the herd. Yeah. In what is heard, there is only the heard. In the felt, there is only the felt. In the cognized, there is only the cognized. There's no subjective entity here, no self that is looking out. Attend closely, he's saying, see things as they are, unadorned, unelaborated, unembellished by conceptual imputations, projections, likes or dislikes of any kind. Let the scene manifest nakedly as the scene, the heard as the heard, the felt as the felt, the cognized as the cognized. Perceive things as they are, and you will see that indeed there is no thing here. There is no thing here. There is no subject self that is independent from all these appearances. This is very difficult for us. We feel that if there is a scene, there must be a seer. There must be a me who's looking out. So the Buddha gave him a meditative practice very similar to what we're learning here. This Bahia is how you should train yourself. Then he described, because Buddha had clairvoyance, he described then what Bahia actually was experiencing. Since Bahia, there is for you in the scene, only the scene, in the herd, only the herd, in the sensed, only the sensed, in the cognized, only the cognized, and you see that there is no thing here, you will therefore see that indeed there is no thing there, one should add either. So we are no longer, this is Wallace now, we are no longer reifying the subject as the observer. Reification is a philosophical term also, where we hold on or fixate or grasp something as some kind of solid thing. So there's no solid me perceiving any of this. So no longer reifying the subject as the observer, you simply attend, or it might be wiser to say, there is simply attention to our impressions 
of mental, visual, auditory, and tactile events, seeing them for what they are. All perceptions, desires, fears, memories, fantasies simply arise and they are recognized as mental events, buts. When you cease reifying yourself, then you will then that you will then cease reifying the appearances to the mind. And remember, mind is also just a label for the arising and engaging with so-called objects of awareness. Remember, a few years ago we were looking at this. That's a long time ago, I know. When we're talking about what is mind, and one of the mind is the arising and engaging with objects of experience. That's it. There's no thing inside here called mind, some kind of thing which we could get hold of, which is somehow me looking outward at things. When you cease reifying yourself, you will then cease reifying appearances to the mind. You will see that since there is no thing here, Indeed, there is no thing there. No reified object exists independently in and of itself. The Buddha then continued, as you see that there is no thing there, you will see that you are therefore located neither in the world of this, nor in the world of that, nor in any place between the two. This alone is the end of suffering. Well, it's not easy, is it? If it were easy, we'd have ended suffering a long time ago. If we understand this immediately, then, then we're very fortunate. But we can get a hint of what he's saying. He's saying things are spacious. We always want to contract space, spaciousness into a me here and stuff out there which is either a threat or it's pleasant or it's, I couldn't care less because it's kind of boring and neutral. We're always locating ourselves as here and stuff there. And that's how we exist. That's so hard to even intellectually feel it could be different, let alone experience it to be different. Yogis experience it to be spacious, but we're not yogis yet, right? Most of us, I guess, I'm not. So we are stuck in me, you, I, that, which of course we shouldn't misinterpret. I am not you, you are not me. But on some level, we can see how holding on to this thing as me and that thing as you creates all the conflict, all the suffering in the world comes from that. Reification, fixating, grasping holding on to something like this. This is me. Sometimes apparently when children are asked, who are you? Who are you? They're young children. They just point outwards, you know, everything. I'm that, I'm spacious. They don't use the word spacious, but they are, there's no gap, there, there is no dichotomy. There is no division between them and just, what they're experiencing. But for us, I'm in here and I'm this, I'm that, I'm suffering, I'm blah, 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 blah. There's so many accretions. We have uh, attracted so much, you know, like a dog turd uh, attracting lots of, you know, flies and so forth, excuse the analogy, but we are like that. We attract all this stuff to this eye, which we have uh, made so important and big and messy. Much worse than, of course, much worse than dog shit. Dog shit is not that dangerous. The eye that we fixated on, <laughs> the biggest danger in the universe. Dog's muck, you can just clean off your feet in a few moments with uh, good detergent and water. But um, this eye, that takes longer. And this is the source of our suffering. So if we want to be kind to ourselves, we have to get to grips with reification, fixation on some kind of real me. As we've been taught, we've, we've mentioned this so many times, but not in this kind of context of loving kindness towards oneself. This is the ultimate loving kindness to ourselves. 
I guess, to investigate emptiness. Would you agree, Elaine? You're nodding. Absolutely. Absolutely, good, great. Why absolutely? Now you have to explain. Why do you agree with it's me? It's the toughest. No, it, it's really the most, the thing that we take um, to be so true and so difficult to get to grips with remembering that it's all just made up of bits and pieces. But what makes you have any faith in what <laughs> the Buddha said? The Buddha is saying something that goes against our immediate experience. So maybe the Buddha is wrong. I know. Do you think the Buddha could be right? No. No. Uh, by personal experience, you know that every time uh, I will get stuck I, again, will get stuck with the I. I am always against a you. You know, there's always something else to battle against. But there is and an I. When, I say there is an I, yes. then there, there is a you, and that's how things are. The Buddha is wrong. No, yes. No. <laughs> yeah. But, now he said something else, where he said, wherever you're going to think like this, you're going to suffer. So if I Come to it from the Maybe other way. Maybe suffering is our birthright. So yeah, we are born to suffer. No, no, it's horrid. So if I don't it's like horrid. it, therefore, uh, I'm not in a state that I want to be in. When am I happy? Is the time when I'm not suffering. If I'm just sitting and and uh, being at ease, I'm not suffering. I'm not engaging with something all the time and grasping and I want and I don't want. But hold then on, I'm hold happy. on. Yeah, but hold on, Elaine. And I'm mm -hmm. acting here as devil's advocate, of course. But um, what if we say, well, that's just how we are. You know, all this talk about Buddha nature becoming enlightened, that's just nonsense. You know, we are suffering beings. We will always suffer because that mm -hmm. this is how it is. No, Kabirji. Uh, prove to you that there is uh, awakening, enlightenment. I don't know. Buddha? I don't know about awakening and enlightenment. I, that's what the Buddha says. As yet, I don't know about the awakening and the enlightenment. But I do do know when I am in a state of um, not suffering. There are bits. There are little. It's like little patches of blue sky that you can see. So that we do have these wonderful moments uh, and we know it from children when someone gives us something or is our mothers are loving towards us, we know what a sense of happiness it gives us. Oh, well, what if and I say that's same temporary? Way, that's just temporary. That's just the so temporary rest. Everything. It's a band-aid. I, band I agree. No, I agree that it's temporary. But that's because we are again shifting into the clinging and grasping gear and that disappears. So why can we not work towards a place where those temporary patches are longer than the suffering patches? Oh, okay, so there may be and some people Slowly, who say it's step mm. by step, maybe we'll come to longer patches of, of the spaciousness, as you said, that blue sky, like I always say through the clouds. Hmm. We may come on a whole clear day and then we can step by step work on that because I know when I'm giving a gift to someone, uh, hmm. I feel good. I really do feel good hmm. and it's nice. And, and when I'm helping somebody, it's a great feeling. So selfishly, this I really likes that, hopefully more than when I'm cribbing away about something. So if I don't want to be in that state, I need to walk towards uh, more patches of more bits of this lovely spaciousness that you're talking about, hoping oh, okay. that it is okay. my true nature. Okay. So you would say for now, part of what you're saying is based on experience, but also on faith, that this experience could be made longer and that there are beings who've experienced it and you have faith that that has happened and you kind of believe to some extent in what the Buddha has taught and what our teachers teach, and you don't think it's propaganda. No. And you don't think it's propaganda because you have had a glimpse yourself of perhaps the potential that is there. Would that make 
does that kind of uh, reflect what you've been saying or you might yes yes Kabuchi. yes Kabuchi. Mm -hmm. so there it could be that suffering forever is not our birthright not at all if we don't i mean if it was our birthright we'd be quite happy in it hmm, that's interesting and we aren't so and we are, and we hate it. Afterwards, we crib about being angry and we crib about everything that we suffer. Maybe we like all the fluff, but uh, we are not happy. And then so the you're kind of arguing, we... yeah, you're arguing that enlightenment or ending of suffering is possible because we don't like suffering. That we are naturally inclined towards happiness, wanting happiness. Yes. Yes, I think we're naturally inclined to being happy. But then what if you're a prisoner in jail? You want to be happy, but you're in jail and you're going to die in jail and you're going to be executed. You're on death row. So then you're, you may, all you want, want to be happy, but you're going to be executed in jail. That's it. No respite. Then what? How, how then, do you know a uh, life? Kabirji, I'd probably get somebody like Rubina. Venerable Rubina to come and tell yeah. me it's in your mind. You can actually be happy even sitting in prison. You just need to train your mind. If I was lucky enough to meet Dharma teachers like that in mm. prison, it would be wonderful. Mm. Okay. Anybody else? Thanks, uh, Elaine. Thank you. You have the Pune air is uh, good, I think. It, Keeping one wide awake. Yes. Yes. Okay. Anybody else? Navinji, where are you? I'm not having as good source of air as Elaine right now. In Kochi, where? there has been last three weeks, it's been apparently there is some kind of pollution emergency here. Lots In Kochi? Of, uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Some waste uh, of land. It's green and pleasant uh, land fire. Yeah. Wow. Oh dear. It caught fire and then uh, I think that's also emblematic oh. of my mind, state of mind right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, in the sense that I really admire what uh, Elaine said in terms of, I think we need some merit to be able to continue having the faith to uh, the teachings and the confidence. No, more than the faith, the confidence in the everyday to go on. And sometimes I do have uh, uh, moments of clarity and sometimes you could call it as a moment of awakening is too strong a word. That moment when you feel, uh, you know, uh, uh, epiphany, uh, yeah, epiphany could be uh, more of a, and yet uh, this gets uh, uh, sunk in a sea of confusion. I mean, it's almost as if Theoretically, you know what uh, Elaine's saying, uh, and yet uh, you're not able to do it every time. And uh, if you actively doubt it, it's actually a, a, a gift. Because when you actively doubt it, then you can uh, confront that source of doubt. You can uh, think about it, meditate upon it. But a lot of times, uh, you are not in that active state. You sort mm. of uh, get into your everydayness routine and uh, sometimes you ritualize what you're doing even that sometimes is good i think oh. but oh. Uh, uh, this uh, points of awakening uh, uh, i'm not sure i mean uh, i see hear elaine very clearly but i'm not sure what patches when we feel the blue or feel good that can be automatically uh, made it into uh, uh, the whole patch the whole or when do we get uh, uh, mistaken is not the word. When do we lose our way and how do we go come back to the path regularly? I mean, the theoretical answer you get is practice, practice and practice, but it is so tough. Sorry, I'm sort of feeling a little, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm not exactly sure what you're saying, but uh, I have an idea. Uh -huh. I think. Basically, it comes down to study, reflection, practice. Study, reflection, meditation, again and again and again and again. Right now, we're just not trained. It's like somebody, I think I mentioned before, who's uh, bemoaning the fact that they can't run 100 meters in 10 seconds, and, but they're not training. You know, they've seen all the videos of all the great runners and they know it's possible, but they're just not prepared to go to the training track 
they're, they're reading all the right books and discussing even with people online, but they're not doing the training. Uh, so then they're not going to be better runners, you know. It feels a bit like that, doesn't it, with our situation. And, and you're right, we are distracted from distraction by distraction, as Eliot says, the great poet. So we are just caught up in our daily routines. We are caught up in our distractions. We know what's good for us, most of us, if we're a little bit intelligent, but we just don't bother. There are all sorts of juicy entertainments, left, right, center. And a lot of habitual entertainments, which are actually not that pleasant, but we you know, indulge in them anyway, because of habit. So remember what Trungpa said, he said that, you know, two great obstacles, habitual patterns and arrogance. By arrogance, he means this clinging to I, me, mine. He calls it arrogance, which is an interesting way of looking at it. There's that arrogance of the I, you know. And then there's the habitual patterns, which remember are coming from beginningless lifetimes, not just a few years in Delhi or London, you know. It's coming from beginningless lifetimes. <clears throat> this wearing of the dark glasses and not seeing things clearly, it's beginningless. So, of course, there's a problem in uh, reversing it. Uh, of course there is, yeah. But we have to, through the glimpses, through the study, through logical thinking, through some clarity. And of course, we're lucky we've seen, or at least I've seen examples of amazing human beings. So then I feel, yeah, something is definitely, something amazing is definitely possible. You know, if I hadn't met the teachers at all, then I think I'd be much more a doubting Thomas, much more. But I've met people who are extraordinary, I feel. And so how did they get that way? You know, they tell us it's not a secret. So then I feel, yeah, this is possible. I do have Buddha nature. Everyone has Buddha nature. Of course, I haven't experienced it yet at any deep level at all, but it makes so much sense, so much sense, much more sense than saying that I don't have Buddha nature or that we are by nature pathetic, suffering, angry, bits of you know meat walking around on the planet. That I don't believe in. <clears throat> Although sometimes it feels that way, but I, I, I don't accept that, <clears throat> which is, I think, good. Good that I don't accept that. Some people do. Heavy duty materialists feel that we're just a bunch of uh, behaviors in a, in a lump of meat in, in, in a basically meaningless universe um, <clears throat> who have one life and then die. That seems a bit pathetic. That's my own prejudice now, my own understanding. Didn't always believe in continuity of consciousness, but I believe in it now, which is not the same as saying I experience it, but I do, I'm totally convinced that there is continuity of consciousness, which I didn't 50 years ago. <clears throat> hmm. Okay. Uh, I think yeah. a, a little more sharply, what I'm trying to say, uh, 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 taking from what Elaine said earlier, is that we, I think many of us are lucky, extremely lucky to have uh, occasionally a transformative experience. Excuse me. And, but it's also a transformative experience. But it's a very different Maybe you turn off your video, there'll be more bandwidth for the sound. Okay. Yeah, uh, okay, I hope uh, this is a little better. What I was trying to say, Kavi, is that I think uh, uh, what Elaine was also suggesting, like what Elaine was also suggesting, I think many of us are extremely lucky to have uh, a transformative experience at one point or the other. But it's also extremely- To have a transformative experience, did you say? Yes, yes. And uh, it is after, it's, uh, it's almost as if that's the easier part. And then uh, it can get very disorienting after the transformative. How do you continue after that? How do you keep, uh, be, I mean, this is related to what you are saying about how to be in some, I mean, there's no point being in Samadhi, right? Uh, so from after the transformative experience, where do you go with it becomes so incredibly it's tough. Clear. Your question is clear. Okay, so the answer is from the teachers, uh, we keep on at it and with a spacious attitude, non-clinging, not wanting to repeat the experience, because if we want to repeat the experience, 
then we won't have it. Basically, the clinging and grasping get in the way uh, because you're creating so much ego around it. So the thing is to relax, to carry on with the study, the reflection and the meditation. And if we are card-carrying Buddhists, as it were, devotion, devotion and compassion are said to be so amazing in creating the causes for realization. So devotion to the teachings, to the guru, the right kind of devotion, and you have to read up about what that could be. So we have to practice proper devotion and generate more and more positive energy through loving kindness, compassion, and of course, study uh, the wisdom teachings and engage in purification. All the teachers, all the beings have said, we cannot, it's like trying to, it's like the Ayurvedic principle that you can go and get all the right diet, all in some wonderful healing center with incredible doctors, but the, the medicines and the uh, treatment will not work until you have, first of all, gone through a process of elimination of the toxins in your body. Because if you don't get rid of the toxins all, all, all over the place, including the digestive tract, then you cannot absorb and benefit from the medicines and all the good food they're giving you. Of course, they realize that, the good centers, then they engage in the detoxification first before they rejuvenate you or whatever they do. So if we don't purify our minds with the practices given in the teachings, there will be no, no meaningful result of our practice, you know? The reason I'm gonna do a one month uh, purification retreat this year is for that reason. My, you know, my teacher very kindly got me to do some retreat this year, which I'll do later this year, I have to. Because without doing purification practice in a very intensive way, nothing happens. There's too many toxins in the system. That's why they give you enema and all these things at good Ayurvedic treatment. You have to get rid of the garbage before. It's like you have to clean your plates. You know, you invite a guest for a meal and you have prepared a wonderful meal. You don't serve it on a dirty plate, yeah, which is still encrusted with food from yesterday. You clean your plates and you shine them and dry them and, you know, then you put the fresh food on the plate. Otherwise, it's disgusting. You know, even your guest, your best friend would be upset if they, you know, you know, have you made a mistake? <laughs> you know, um, so purification. Without it, we want, of course, things our way. We don't want to spend time the hard way purifying. Uh, you know, look at what the great teachers have put their disciples through. Look what Marpa put Melarepa through. That is purification. He knew Marpa had incredible potential that he would be his best disciple but he knew he had to purify first. So he beat him up, he kicked him out of teaching saying, you're not ready yet. As you know, the story, he made him build all these towers and then dismantle them. Why? He, Marpa wasn't a sadist. He knew exactly what the student needed to purify. Um, so there's that as well. Sorry, long answer, but we don't purify, we can, come to as many online sessions as we want, but we won't get any results, you know. And of course, not just online, but we can come to Tashita and also not get any results. Because not only do we not study, reflect and meditate, but we don't engage in any kind of purification practice like mantra or prostrations and all the other practices that are there in the tradition. So yeah, it's, uh, there's some work to be done. We've put a lot of work, a lot of energy into samsara. And um, if you think about it, it's amazing. Think how much effort we have put into this life. Just this life. Forget being these lives. Your family, your wife, your children, or your work, getting up every day and cleaning yourself, cleaning your house, everything. Hundreds of thousands of things we have done. Just the thousands of things we have done today, just to survive. All that effort. Right? So then we think there's no effort on the spiritual path, that it's going to come easily. Come on. You know. It takes effort just to get the dust out of your house in one day. You can't do it if you're on your own, possibly. Think how much time it's necessary just to clean a house. So cleaning our mind, hmm, does that make sense?
I think it may, it makes sense to me, but that's because I'm saying it. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it makes sense to you. Uh, it makes sense to Sagar. He's nodding. He's grinning in his purple light. Is it purple t-shirt? Yeah. He has a purple t-shirt with a, not a smiley, but a something on it. It's evolved in his use of t-shirts. Remember, yeah, he used to be all black. So I think the teachings or something is doing him some good. But um, yeah, so we need to purify, we need to accumulate positive energy through meditation and through kindness and compassion and so forth. And they say without proper devotion also, we may not have the deep transformative experience, devotion to a proper guide, proper guru. Because I think that's the one that really erases the ego. Because if there's no guru, then there is that sense that I am doing this, you know, under my own power and you know, no one else. There's it's kind of that way also, I think. We could even be building up the ego, thinking we're really brilliant, you know. That's uh, disastrous. Okay, it's eight o'clock. I'm stopping now. Uh, Auntie has a, an old friend at home and uh, also we need to eat on time today. No television today, no Netflix because we have a guest. So I'm not going to pollute my mind this evening with Delhi crime, which is a horrible story, of course, but uh, br rather brilliantly done, I have to say. But the story is horrible. Sick, not only because of what happened to the girl, but just the whole background of what conditions that make people act in that way. It's just so sad. So dreadful. Because everything, remember, is causes and conditions, and nobody is inherently evil. So although what people do to each other can feel inherently evil, there is no inherent evil. It is causes and conditions, temporary. And the sufferer, as well as the perpetrators of anything in this world, who are humans, uh, well, they all have Buddha nature, but tragically, deeply, uh, obscured in some people. But anyway, uh, ha -ha, how to transform Delhi crime into a meditation, huh? yeah. Um, but there won't be any Delhi crime tonight. It's uh, just eating, eating and talking with uh, Auntie's friend. Okay, so look, thank you all very, very much. Um, very kind of all of you to join and uh, discuss and um, want to uh, we must dedicate the positive energy to the happiness and welfare of all beings that the conflict in the world especially ukraine may cease so many are dying there now so many are dying you know they're trying to it's it's just a big deal for the russians and the ukrainians to hold on to this one town bakhmut you know the russians want to uh, grab it from the ukrainians the ukrainians want to defend it and so many People are dying from both sides in that battle for Bakhmut uh, in south, uh, southeastern Ukraine. And so many uh, civilians have died and been displaced. And of course, a whole ecosystem, a whole infrastructure destroyed. Imagine, you know, how long it took to build up that you know, place, that ecosystem, that uh, town is being totally destroyed. So anyway, pray for people who are in such situation that they may, the causes and conditions may change quickly. They will, of course, in time, but and the residue will be dreadful. The karmic causes created will give their suffering results in the future as well. But may uh, the beings um, begin to understand the need to be kind to one another themselves, starting with themselves, and uh, yeah, and then may we all have long and healthy lives and be able to practice, we'll never be separated from authentic teachings and teachers. May all our great teachers have long and healthy lives, especially His Holiness and Dalai Lama and Gabji Lama Zoprimpache, all the other great teachers. May we never uh, fail to uh, be of benefit to others. May we never give up. May we take seriously our 
commitments to benefit others <clears throat> if we have them and even if we don't have vows may we uh, proceed in the good in what is beneficial Okay, today's Tuesday, so our next session is on uh, Thursday evening at 6.30. Thank you all very much. Thank you.